and eventual Wisconsin statehood. In the decades to come, the federal government would wage war and armed assault on the Ho-Chunk, forcing them beyond the borders of what became Wisconsin territory and the state of Wisconsin. Colonial violence would not end with the forced removal of the Ho-Chunk. In the midst of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, whose iconic statue sits on Bascom Hill, signed the Morrill Act. This piece of legislation created the University of Wisconsin system so many know and recognize today by creating the land grant university system. In Wisconsin, the Treaty of 1837 alone allowed for over 1 million acres of land to be funneled into the land grant system of 33 separate universities, more than any other single land session or land grab. The University of Wisconsin acquired over 235,000 acres of indigenous land to add to their endowment. I share this today to move beyond a land acknowledgement statement. Instead, like my colleague Casey Keeler yesterday, I call on each of you to make change, to know this history, to tell this history, to educate yourselves on dispossession and decolonization, and to demand change. A great starting point in the change making process is the scholarship of Dr. Nick Estes, who has long advocated for honoring treaties and returning Indian land that was taken through theft and violence. This is the social justice work also of the Havens Rights Center, work that occurs both within the academy and beyond the walls of it, work that demands commitment and awareness, work that requires critical self-reflection, careful analysis, and informed debate. Today, we welcome Dr. Nick Estes, who will share not only his scholarship with us, but his on the ground experience working for social justice and social change with indigenous communities. Dr. Estes is, is a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, located in central South Dakota, along the Missouri River, part of the Great Sioux Nation. Dr. Estes is an assistant professor in the Department of American Studies at the University of New Mexico, where he earned his PhD. In early 2019, his book, Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance was published with Verso Press. The same year, he was co-editor of Standing with Standing Rock, Voices from the Hashtag No Dapple Movement, a collection of voices from the Standing Rock Movement and beyond, published with the University of Minnesota Press. In 2016, he co-edited a valuable and timely online resource, Standing Rock, Hashtag no Dapple and Mini Wiconi, Wichoni, sorry, my, my apologies. Although this is only the beginning of my second year of graduate coursework, Dr. Estes' book has already been assigned in three of my history seminars. Our History is the Future, it has already and continues to inform and influence a generation of scholars and activists who have been profoundly shaped by this work. Additionally, Estes has published numerous far-reaching essays, as well as book chapters and articles that center indigenous peoples, challenges ongoing settler colonialism and racism that exists all around us, and pushes for a critical look at decolonization. Yesterday and today, Dr. Estes joins us for two talks on environmentalism, decolonization, and indigenous activism, echoing the mission of the Havens Rights Center. Today's talk is titled, Tragedy and Revolutionary Hope, Climate Justice and Decolonization. If it's anything like yesterday's talk, we're certainly in for a treat. Now, please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Nick Estes. Thank you again for joining us for the second part of this uh, lecture series. And I also just want to uh, thank uh, both Casey and Zeta for pointing out um, that this is more than just about land acknowledgements uh, or recognition. Uh, and this actually fits nicely into uh, the talk that I have prepared uh, for you all today, specifically uh, around the question of land back. The Indian trader Andrew Mirick might have fancied himself a poet for once telling a group of starving Dakota people Quote, if they are hungry, let them eat grass. This was after he had refused to extend them store credit to buy food. A civil war over the right of some white people to own black people had engulfed the United States, turning its attention and money away from its treaty responsibilities to the indigenous. 
1851, starving Dakotas sold their homelands west of the Mississippi River to land-hungry whites. European settlers had, fr had flooded Minnesota, Minnesota Makoche, or the land where the waters reflect the clouds, killing or chasing away most of the game. The exchange that mediated native white relations was straightforward, land for food. What little remained of that territory wasn't enough to eke out a sustainable harvest or hunt. Like many white men, Merrick and his brother Nathan built a lucrative enterprise of dealing in Dakota misery by selling goods on credit and then claiming the monthly cash payments guaranteed to individual Dakotas. Treaty money first lined their pockets before it ever made it into Dakota hands. And once the federal dollars stopped, so too did the extension of credit. No credit, no food. Let them eat grass. Like Mary Antoinette before him, Merrick paid with his life for such bad poetry. Dakotas possessed poetry too, which for their enemies, they adorned with irony. It was midsummer 1862 when their uprising began. After returning empty-handed from a hunt, four young and destitute Dakota men entered the property of, of a white store owner and attempted to steal some chicken eggs. Deprived of their dignity, they then shot and killed five settlers to prove they feared no white man. They knew the backlash would be swift and brutal. Taoya Te Duta, the Dakota leader known as Little Crow, led his people into a bloody, a bloody war he realized was unavoidable. He faced two choices, starve to death or expel those who brought ruin upon his nation. He chose to live and he looked no further than Andrew Merrick's well-stocked storehouse and lower agency, among Dakotas who lived by the Bible and the plow. Warriors shot the white trader dead as he made a hasty getaway. The shop was looted and burned to the ground. Merrick's mutilated body was found later, his head severed, and his mouth stuffed with grass. I am inclined to call this act by the Dakota warriors a poem, writes Lakota poet Lely Long Soldier. Good poetry, be it an act of violence or otherwise, can preserve a memory that belongs to the future. And not all poem, poems are textual. Some are composed without words. The same could be said of how we understand the history of this land through the prose of property relations. The change and adaptation of a language, whether through verses or actions, reflects a larger archive of historical experience. During this time, the Dakotas were entirely illiterate, even though most couldn't read, uh, or excuse me, during this time, the Dakotas weren't entirely illiterate even though most couldn't read or write, let alone speak or understand English. They had learned, however, how to draw an X in a clerk's ledger next to their names when buying goods on credit. The first acts of Dakota writing became nearly synonymous with amassing debt. The root word of wichazo, the Dakota word for pen or pencil, is ichazo, which carries two distinct meanings the first is to buy something on credit, to owe or to be in debt. The second is to mark something with or to make a line. When the Dakota warriors burned the trade stores and with them the ledger books, they destroyed their own written archive of the debts marked by an X they had accrued from the very people who took their lands. Burning down a building cannot be mistranslated or misunderstood. And it carries a deeper meaning than an X mark, the symbol that has come to signify assent, cooperation, and agreement. The sentiments of dissent, on the other hand, have in our hypertextual age been summed up by a hashtag that incites fear in white America as much as it clarifies indigenous aspirations that likewise don't suffer from ambiguity. Hashtag land back. People get confused about what we want as native people. Denzel Sutherland of the Gitson Nation said last January when speaking on the eviction of the Coastal Gas League Pipeline Company from the lands of the Wet'suwet'en Nation nine days earlier. It's like, what do you want? Just land back. It's funny though. When I said that to my dad, you know, 
the Gitson Wet'suwet'en people, if you tell them about land back, they're like, we never lost the land anyway, which is also true. And as we all know, those blockades that happening at the beginning of this year, which almost seems like decades ago, um, given how time has passed, um, began to hurt the Canadian economy. And they didn't just hurt the Canadian economy at the site of extraction. They hurt the, the Canadian economy because across uh, the, the nation, Indigenous nations began a railroad blockade and major business associations wrote to the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, to end such blockades. And on February 18th, about a month after um, Denzel made the statement, the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Association issued a media release calling on the federal government to restore all rail services in the country. According to the association, for every day that the rail blockade continued, about $425 million worth of manufactured goods that are usually carried by rail sit or sat idle. Each day the rail lines were disrupted, required three to four days of supply chains to recover. And blockades, excuse me, <clears throat> um, the blockades um, are oper were operating within a larger context of mass mobilization, making them effective, with the kind of choke point being at the um, the Wet'suwet'en, uh, uh, the, the Wet'suwet'en, um, or the, excuse me, the Unistoten camp that was blocking coastal gas links access to Wet'suwet'en territory. So if you look historically, almost every protest or direct action has resulted in the government having to negotiate on terms that it wouldn't have without those type of actions, says the Yellow Knives Diné scholar, um, Glenn Coulter of the blockades. And the key takeaway here was that the blockades, te uh, what the blockades teach is that indigenous resistance is able to get certain demands met um, that would otherwise be non-negotiable. And in this case, it's more than just about you know, what we understand as climate justice and stopping the flow and transport of goods, but it's actually uh, shutting down, you know, large sections of the Canadian economy, um, all because of an indigenous blockade. Um, and this is, you know, this is uh, where I would say that the Wet'suwet'en struggle intersects, you know, it, it was kind of, it happened just this year. And I think it's kind of fallen out of people's uh, uh, memories, um, but it's, it, it's you know part of the longer kind of constellation of struggles um, that that use the tactic of blockade, uh, or what are you know called you know sometimes as land reoccupations, um, and I think the the most important one would be you know of this generation would be the um, what happened at Standing Rock, and what happened at Standing Rock was part of a larger or excuse me a longer resistance movement for the not just the liberation of the Ochete Shakomi uh, and the water itself, uh, but also it it falls within a larger tradition of emancipating the earth from capital, something that I talked about um, yesterday for those of you who attended um, that lecture. So in the specific case of the Ochete Shakoi and the Standing Rock uh, Sioux tribe, uh, it, within the boundaries of uh, North Dakota, you know, settlers have attempted to construct various forms of infrastructure across our river, which we call Mini Sose, and which they call the Missouri River. Rather, routes for the penetration of the fur trade or steamboat travel, massive earth enrolled hydroelectric dams or oil pipelines. In opposition to the infrastructures of settler colonialism, which are more than physical things, uh, but also include forms of white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, and imperialism, which I try to document in my book. Um, I also trace a formation of distinct political identities, their own forms of infrastructural knowledge that are simultaneously anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, and non-hierarchical. What I call uh, traditions of indigenous resistance. Uh, and specifically in the, in the case of my book, I call it um, you know, the Ocheti Shakoni tradition of resistance, uh, which is a radical theory of history. And this brings about uh, other kinds of relationships that I deal with in the book um, that I'm also working through and work um, that, I'm, uh, work that I'm, I'm doing now. And that is the, our relationship to a radical indigenous past that trespasses into the present and provides a, pass, a pathway to a more just and sustainable future. And what I refer to as traditions of indigenous resistance differs from how tradition is understood as a static unchanging practice, a view that aligns itself with the idea of a, 
of an authentic essentialist or apolitical notion of indigenous identity. This conservative view often works in favor of the trope of the vanishing Indian and reckons with history and the present as some wish it to be and not as it is. Traditions of indigenous resistance can best be described as what you know, a scho a scholar uh, Raymond Williams calls a selective tradition. A selective, a selective tradition chooses prior experiences of one's ancestors as forebears and sometimes as active participants. Hence the American Indian movement's popular phrase in the spirit of crazy horse to inform current resistance movements while sustaining them as part of a living tradition under constant formation. In this sense, traditions of indigenous resistance are not entirely new, nor are they necessarily a checklist of people or concepts. Traditions of indigenous resistance are an accumulation or steady accretion of ways of knowing, experiencing, and practicing relationality to humans and non-humans, a radical consciousness deeply embedded in history and place that expresses the ultimate desire for freedom and liberation. To know and trust one's history is not to be defeated by it. And from these traditions arise indigenous radicals and indigenous radicalism. And to be radical means to get at the root of something, to get at the root of settler colonialism and how to get free from it, we must turn to those who have resisted it the longest to return to the source, as I said yesterday, uh, as, and also as Marxist uh, revolutionary Amilcar Cabral reminds us, is to always ask what came before and existed alongside and in spite of, of colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. And a reminder that these are not naturally occurring systems, nor are they inevitable. A return to the source for Cabral is a political process rather than a cultural event. More importantly, it asks what proliferates in the absence of empire. And by studying alternative histories or indigenous uh, resistance, we can begin to imagine alternative futures. Um, the No Dapple movement, for example, exists within a longer history of indigenous res uh, uh, resistance. Um, and it also speaks to a larger history of relationships uh, between the Ocheti Shakoi and, and the Missouri River, uh, but also between indigenous nations and the United States as an occupying power. This approach uh, employs what seminal historian uh, Susan Miller has called a global indigenous paradigm. Global because indigenous history is neither parochial nor a subfield of US history. And in fact, I would argue that US history is a subfield of indigenous history, but it's a covetous branch, right? That thinks it's the tree. <laughs> it's the history of the United States. Uh, An indigenous paradigm's ultimate purpose is, quote, to place indigenous peoples and communities at the center of historical narratives. This approach asserts US history cannot be told without indigenous peoples, and neither can the history of planetary enterprises such as capitalism and imperialism, processes often benignly called globalization. Indigenous peoples were and still are very much a part of these processes too and cannot be considered just local cultures or our, you know, our knowledge is just local knowledge. From this perspective, we can understand re indigenous resistance as a future-oriented politics that centers relations which have far uh, reaching implications that extend beyond politics and processes that might be construed as only indigenous, right? The goal is to establish or reestablish correct relations with the human and non-human world for there to be a viable future. And this, you know, this uh, manifests itself in the Ochete Shakoi affirmation, such as, you know, water is life or mini wichoni. Uh, but also the practice of wotakuye, which means to be a good relative. Um, so fundamentally, um, Miller or Susan Miller writes, indigenousness is a way of relating. And I think that's a really key uh, way to understand um, how indigenous studies um, is, is really grounded within a world of relations and understanding those relations. Um, and as I document, you know, in my book, I, I connect the, the mini Sose or the Missouri River in connection to uh, this kind of broader uh, geopolitical landscape um, that is not just Ochete Shakoni territory, but what is known as the Missouri River Basin. And its connection to uh, land struggles going back to, you know, the Black Hills land claim, um, or a place we call the center of the world or Hesapa. Uh, it was also here in this landscape 
in this history that te chinchala skawi or te skawi, the white buffalo calf woman, established the basis of not only human customary and ceremonial laws, but also how Lakotas would exist in correct relations to the Pteo Yate and the non-human world. The first compact or treaty with the non-human world is recorded in Si Chonggu historian Brown Hat's winter count. His earliest pictograph depicts the white buffalo calf woman as a white buffalo arriving in the center of a camp circle in the first decade of the 10th century. Above the white buffalo is a calf pipe, a yucca plant, and a corn stalk. To the right, in English, Brown Hat lists the various animal nations the white buffalo calf woman brought into formal relations with the Ocheti Shakomi, elk, deer, antelope, buffalo, beaver, and wolves. According to this history, it was the woman, or it was a woman who first formalized the first compact, the first treaty, with the buffalo nations and their human relatives. To be a good relative is to honor that original instruction. Lakotas often view treaties with the United States and other nations as commitments, not just to human relations, but also to non-human relations. And such agreements were not the sole domain of men, as was the tradition of white society. And most importantly, pte means uh, female buffalo. And pteo yate was alter alternatively known as her nation. So in 1868, uh, excuse me, the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty established a 32 million acre permanent reservation, which encompassed the entirety of present day West River, South Dakota. To appease those who uh, refuse agency life, a vast expanse of hunting grounds was set aside at nearly the same acreage of a permanent reservation, making the total territory more than 70 million acres, or about the size of, present, of the present day state of Nevada. So our treaty territory, according to the 68 treaty, is about um, 70 million acres. Article 11, or excuse me, is about the size of, of the state of Nevada. So Article 11 of the treaty, however, stipulated the Lakota surrendered, quote, all right to occupy permanently the territory outside their reservation as herein defined, but retained the right to hunt in the Powder River country, quote, so long as the buffalo may range thereon in numbers to justify the chase. End quote. General William Tecumseh Sherman, a member of the 1868 Peace Commission, for, at, first opposed this, uh, at first opposed this provision, fearing that sustained resistance through buffalo hunting over a vast region would make it impossible to rein in the militant divisions. Fellow peace commissioners, however, assured him the treaty's clause was only, quote, merely temporary, because once the buffalo were vanquished, so too would the millions of acres of hunting territory. In 1903, Red Cloud recalled what Lakota said to treaty commissioners regarding the hunting lands, quote, we told them that the country of the buffalo was the country of the Lakotas. We told them that the buffalo must have their country and the Lakotas must have their buffalo, end quote. The Lakotas didn't believe the U.S. had the right to simply give them back land that already rightfully belonged to them and their buffalo kin. Red, uh, Red Cloud made clear that the 1868 treaty was not an agreement only between two human nations, but also an agreement among non-human ones as well, including the Buffalo Nations. That Lakota territory began and ended with the Buffalo Nations territory was his interpretation. This understanding was not a mystical reading, uh, but a simple fact of Lakota life. And at this time, a fact linked to pure survival. When Red, Red Cloud spoke of the Buffalo Nations, the Pateo Yate, he spoke of their true leaders, the women, not the bulls or the men, and the original covenant with the white buffalo calf woman. Therefore, the future of the Ochete Shakoi was bound to the future of the Piteo Yate and vice versa. For its part, the military took seriously this vital connection with the buffalo as sustaining continued indigenous resistance. The frontier army's operations were as much about securing armed defeat as much as they were about exterminating uh, the buffalo, uh, the, buff the remaining buffalo herds. But punishing highly mobile Plains nations by defeating them in conventional battles was near impossible. So from 1865 to 1883, the Frontier Army sanctioned the mass slaughter of, of the buffalo to shatter the will to resist by eliminating a primary food supply and a close relative. 
The extermination of the buffalo was incredibly effective and efficient, and two decades, soldiers and hunters eradicated, eradicated the remaining 10 to 15 million buffaloes, leaving only several hundred survivors. And taking only the hides and leaving the rest of the animal to rot, the rancid smell of decaying carcasses wafted over the plains. Hunters often poisoned their kill. The strychnine-laced carcasses killed off uh, starved scavengers, such as bears, wolves, or coyotes, and sometimes native people themselves, all obstacles for white settlement. In this way, we can understand settler colonialism as more than just the elimination of the native. Settler colonialism is a specific form of colonialism whereby an imperial power seizes native territory, eliminates the original people by force, removal or political and political liquidation, and resettles the land uh, with a foreign invading population. Unlike the European Holocaust, which had a beginning and an end and targeted non-humans alone, or humans alone, indigenous elimination as a practice and a formal policy has not ended and this also entails the wholesale destruction of non-human relations. This extends to things such as rivers, um, in some cases deserts, like here in, in this particular area, in this landscape, the desert is often seen as a, an area that's a wasteland, a place that is devoid of life, right? There's a reason why uh, they chose the Nevada test site as a place to test the nuclear weapons, right? Um, my good friend and colleague, Kristen Simmons, a Paiute anthropologist, has done a wonderful job at explaining how um, wasteland, you know, uh, such as the Paiute homelands have become a place for nuclear testing and nuclear colonialism. Um, and this is, you know, this is really uh, the, the premise of the book um, that I wrote uh, and thinking about the river as, you know, uh, or water as a, as a tool of settler colonialism uh, in ways that is about the land, but it's also about um, wasting that land and how our land was targeted for destruction not because you know, it held a specific value uh, for settler society to take, um, but because it had, a, had the value of being wasted and that they could build these dams for the benefit of surrounding settler communities um, by destroying our lands and not theirs. Um, <clears throat> and I think that really gets to uh, this idea of, of indigenous uh, covenants that are made uh, and understandings of, um, of you know the idea of water protector and the water the idea of a water protector a treaty defender or a land protector extends beyond just this kind of category of uh, activism i think um it and, and in fact it, it, re it requires something that involves caretaking and care especially in a nation like the united states which i would say is a carelessness uh, is based on carelessness itself um, something that is completely defined by, you know, things such as neoliberal capitalism. Um, but the, you know, the, the camps at Standing Rock uh, evoked kind of an essence of our current struggle and our current conjuncture. Um, and it was here at the, at the, the confluence of the Cannonball and Missouri Rivers uh, that water shaped earth, um, but also how state institutions changed the landscape and thus changed history itself. Um, and land and water are also about what should be, you know, a, vile, a viable future. And when land, or, land and water are taken or destroyed, the past is lost with them. And so too is a possibility of a livable future. And this isn't just something, again, that's reserved for indigenous people. Put another way, to enact violence against the land and water is also to enact violence against those who depend on it for life. And this goes beyond, again, just indigenous people. It goes, it affects everybody. And the consequences for violating these indigenous covenants, uh, these indigenous treaties, extends far beyond the human world. Global warming and the sixth mass, mass extinction event are the apocalyptic results of, a ca of this cascading imbalance. While those most responsible for climate change, such as the imperial nations of the global north, have proposed remedies through capitalist markets and techno fixes, None so far have sought to rectify their own responsibility. And the, fa the failure to act holds the entire future hostage. Original instructions which emphasize peaceful and mutual relations between humans, uh, between humans and between humans and non-humans inform the very way indigenous people have historically entered into relations with European nations. 
Even if in original instructions are not reciprocated, each party to a treaty has equal power to interpret the meaning of that agreement. While colonizers have chosen to interpret treaties to advance their own genocidal interests, indigenous peoples have never surrendered the moral authority, responsibility, or sense of justice that original instructions mandate. One of the most important expressions of this commitment is the People's Accords, which were ratified in 2010 in Cochabamba, Bolivia. The Accords proposed not only just relations with the non-human world, but also upending the cause of unequal relations between entire nations and humans themselves, imperialism and capitalism. Under the indigenous leadership of the movement towards socialism, the People's Accords infused traditional ecological knowledge with ecofeminism, ecosocialism, and anti-imperialism. The indigenous Andean Cosmo vision of Viver Bien, or Living Well, and Pachamama, or Mother Earth, are central to understanding the People's Accords. Living Well is not anthropocentric or focused solely on human relations. It is Earth-centric, focusing on the whole. It understands that capitalist domination over nature is patriarchal and that overconsumption, which is driven primarily by the first world, is not the solution, but the problem. If all humanity consumed as much as the average US citizen, we would need four Earths to sustain it. We only have one planet to share and just relations with the natural world are impossible without just equitable relations among humanity first. Like, you know, things such as the Red Deal, um, which uh, I helped uh, write uh, through our organization, um, the, the Red Nation, the People's Accords are an indigenous treaty, a covenant with the earth and its people. The US backed right wing military coup that deposed Moss leader or the um, movement towards socialism leader and Bolivian president Evo Morales in 2019 was also a coup against this eco covenant and indigenous socialism. It is necessary now more than ever to reestablish correct relations by enforcing the original um, covenant, a living document or treaty with the earth, uh, as many uh, scholars argue, and movements. This begins by upholding the indigenous interpretation and authority over all treaties and agreements made with colonial powers, whether these agreements were struck 300 years ago or yesterday. There are also hundreds of multilateral agreements and treaties with social movements and the humble people of the earth that require enforcement. And we can't and won't wait um, for, you know, the, the, those who are most responsible for uh, climate change to act. Um, the power uh, has always been in the hands of those uh, who enact natural law to restore balance in accordance with indigenous principles. Um, and I, I believe, you know, strongly that remembering and historical memory of these treaties, of these covenants, must arise in hope and not just in nightmare. Um, a project of the future which is historically mediated, but which pours, pours forth history making, meaning that we're not just trapped by the past itself, or that we live in the past itself, but we, we constantly try to derive meaning from it. And that's what I've tried to do uh, in this talk um, today, but also, thinking about this as an as a ongoing political project. And I would say that settler colonialism, uh, since it's Halloween, right, let's talk about ghosts. Um, we, we talk a lot about, you know, um, uh, there was just a, a, a podcast episode that dropped today uh, with a partnership, a partner podcast that we, um, that we produce called Red Power Hour, which is hosted by Melanie Yazzie. And the title of the podcast is called The the Stephen King Industrial Complex, which is kind of a joke <laughs> around Stephen King. Um, he's made his career off of dead Indians. Uh, every like tw plot twist in Stephen King horror is that it's on an Indian burial ground. Um, and it's kind of a, it's a common device that's used not just in fiction writing or in popular culture, but it's a, it's a common device that's used in the popular understanding of indigenous people as always dead or dying, right? Um, and that we're, we, we're simply specters or we're simply ghosts upon our own land. And settler colonialism, I would say, is about exercising uh, the specter of indigenous people, right, from this land uh, and the land upon which we all live. 
Um, and the reason why this exorcism exists uh, is to prevent, you know, um, a, a possible future of liberation or a possible future uh, of, of mutual existence on this particular land. And so instead of seeking to merely overcome settler colonialism, uh, by studying indigenous social uh, movements, we can see that the focus um, is on what settler colonialism must always obstruct, the collective capacity to create, care for, and enjoy uh, this particular land uh, in according to indigenous knowledges and traditions. Um, and I think this really grounds you know, uh, this analysis within the contemporary moment uh, and we, especially when we think about the politics of care, because I, you know, again, the United States is defined by its carelessness. If we think about somebody like Trump and the brazenness to just deny, publicly deny, but privately acknowledge the existence of COVID-19, and then to be so careless as to not only contract it himself, but to spread it to others, right? Um, this is defined, this is, I would say like is a, is a definition or a larger kind of understanding of how settler colonialism works and that it, it doesn't operate on care. You know, it's not caring about, but it's caring for. Caring for people, caring for the land itself. Instead, I would say that it's defined by profit making. Profit making, if settler, if indigenous elimination is the organizing principle of settler colonialism, as many scholars uh, have argued, I would say that profit making has become the organizing principle of life under neoliberal capitalism. And we understand the antithesis to this or the alternative to this profit making system, which you know, commodifies not only uh, labor, but also land itself, uh, would be care or mutual aid. And we understand these words in English uh, and, and, and in particular um, from kind of leftist or socialist Marxist anarchist traditions as arising from, you know, kind of European uh, mutual aid is a term that was used by uh, Peter Kropotkin, who is an anarch a Russian anarchist who, you know, was kind of countering, not so much countering the theories of Darwin, but countering the theories of social Darwinists um, and saying that actually mutual aid is a factor of, as much of a factor of, of evolution, biological evolution, as is competition um, and the scarcity of resources. Uh, and in indigenous societies, I would say that we've always understood this in the sense that it's not so much mutual aid as it is kinship and relations uh, and relation building. Um, <clears throat> and we can think about, you know, just like a, as an example of um, how profit making has superseded uh, relations of care in the United States. Oil giants, big pharma and tech firms like Amazon and Google have become more powerful and richer than entire nations, right? Not just indigenous nations, but nations in general with little or zero accountability to anyone but themselves and to the profit motive itself. So as we think about this in terms of things such as water protector, land defender, treaty defender, we, this, this term uh, caretaking arises and you know, I, I point everyone to the scholarship of Kim Talbert again, um, to think about uh, caretaking as, um, as not just a, uh, an alternative in this particular moment, but something that has existed uh, you know, for uh, historically uh, in indigenous uh, modes of knowing and being. So similar to how women and non-men have been historically tasked with doing unpaid labor of housework and child rearing, the relationship indigenous caretakers have with the land, water, air, and non-human world is typically not viewed as quote unquote productive, right? The financial service uh, industrial or technology sectors usually defines what counts as a job or what counts as work. And it's frequently bound up with polluting or extractive industries. Rarely is indigenous caretaking defined as work. Yet unlike, uh, unlike excuse me, yet like unwaged caregiving work, land defense and water protection are undervalued but necessary for the continuation on a life or continuation of life on a planet teetering on ecological collapse. So despite preserving the very elements needed to sustain life, such as clean air, water, and land from settler states, repression against indigenous people protecting their territories runs rampant. Uh, in many ways, you know, it's not that we're trying to create a new kind of caretaking economy, but in fact, this caretaking economy is already in place. 
three quarters of land-based environments and two thirds of marine environments have been affected by capitalist development. But environmental degradation has been less severe in places managed by indigenous people and in local communities, uh, a UN report recently found. While making up only 5% of the world's population, indigenous peoples also protect 80% of the world's uh, biodiversity. Indigenous peoples and local communities who have distinct cultural and social ties to ancestral homelands and bioregions still caretake at least a quarter, a quarter of the world's land area. This includes places that are the lungs of the world, such as the Amazon rainforest and its veins like the Missouri River Basin, which I talked about before. Areas facing existential threats of deforestation, damming, water contamination, oil and gas development, and mining. Indigenous people protect the land, air, and water we all need to live. This is why Indigenous environmental activists uh, are so severely criminalized and targeted for assassination in response to our organizing throughout the world. Simply put, we are always in the way. In the United States, indigenous caretakers have been most the most confrontational arm of the environmental movement by blocking the construction of oil pipelines and the flurry of new federal and state laws specifically targets this tactic. Following the Standing Rock protests, for example, eight states have passed American Legislative Exchange Council or ALEC inspired critical infrastructure laws criminalizing the protesting of pipelines. New legislation proposed uh, by Trump um, would actually make, you know, inhibiting the operation of an oil pipeline, such as simply standing in the way of construction, an offense punishable with decades of prison, prison time. And even more recently, states such as South Dakota have passed uh, what, they, what they call riot boosting laws, which are, which is legislation that isn't written by ALEC, right? And if anybody wants to know like the deep history of ALEC, just go read Democracy in Chains uh, by Nancy McLean. Um, you know, it's this longer kind of, uh, you know, uh, project by the, by the right wing to, um, you know, create these model, you know, any, anything from anti-BDS laws to stand your ground laws um, to voter suppression, right? And critical infrastructure for oil pipelines. Think about it. The right is already intersectional. They got Palestine. <laughs> they got uh, you know the 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 killing of of um, Trayvon Martin, right, which led to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, voter suppression, and then also Standing Rock, right. These things uh, they see all of these things as interrelated. Um, the only thing that they haven't really, and maybe uh, maybe they are in getting into this now, but the only thing they haven't really uh, ventured into is um, immigration. Um, and maybe you could make the argument that this, this has something to do with the voter suppression stuff, but um, <clears throat> So in this and you know, just to kind of wrap up and thinking about this particular moment in time that we're living in I'd say that nothing captures the grievance of white America more than white men armed with assault rifles roaming city streets with the stated aim of quote protecting private property from Black Lives Matter and anti-fascist protesters after the killing of George Floyd, Minneapolis became the epicenter of uprisings against this idea of private property. Floyd, after all, was killed for allegedly trying to buy cigarettes at a convenience store with a counterfeit $20 bill. This was 100 miles from where starving Dakotas were first told to eat grass by a store owner in 1862. This is where land back intersects with black freedom struggles. Whereas indigenous relations with the land are based on reciprocity and responsibility, right, white relations or settler relations are simply governed by property. And so to, to give you an idea of what I mean by that, land for a settler society is turned into property, right? To be dispossessed from indigenous people. On the other hand, black folks have been historically barred from owning property and have in fact been criminalized through property laws. And when it concerns the land, the past hasn't already happened. The taking of a, uh, of a continent isn't a fait accompli. His history must be continually retold. Why? The ignoring of what came before the United States as it concerns to land itself treats the indigenous as a people without history. Land back, there is therefore a demand for the future back. The indigenous have been treated as specters haunting the Americas, as I said before. 
So in 1890, left with only being ghosts, indigenous people communed with them through the prophetic ghost dance, which was a, which was in a quote unquote apocalyptic vision according to whites, because the central tenet of that vision was land back to the indigenous. But these were not ghosts. These were ancestors of the future. As I, as I argue in the book that the ghost dance wasn't an apocalyptic or messianic movement, but in fact, it was a, a revolutionary movement that challenged um, the, the colonial imposition of reservation life and, and imagined what not a return to indigenous, you know, uh, life was like prior to colonialism, but a, a, what imagined what life, indigenous life in the future would be like on uh, their own land and according to their own terms. And it's not that land back is simply anti-colonialism. It is that colonialism with its jackbooted police, armed white supremacists, tear gas prisons, wars, and all its theologies of power is set up, set up to block the emergence of an indigenous plenty or an indigenous abundance. So far from being solely a land theft enterprise, it always blocks the invention of the future. The spray painting of land back on a riot shield during the July 3rd protests against Trump is that poetry of the future. The burning of the three third precinct was an act of poetry. So too is the burning of storefronts and the burning, the burning of cop cars, because these things cannot be co-opted. You know, these things cannot be watered down like terms such as decolonizations. There's nothing metaphorical about them. So with that, I'll just, I'll turn it over to Q and A.